All right, we're going to get started talking about renal physiology. So I gave you one PowerPoint to cover two weeks of content. So we're going to cover roughly the first half today. So just kind of an overview of the urinary system from general A&P. We have a pair of kidneys. They lie on the back wall. It's called the retro, they are retro peritoneal, which means they lie behind the peritoneal cavity and they're covered by their own little membrane stuck to the back there. They don't really have a protective covering, so the kidneys are at risk for injury, um, you know, in car accidents and, you know, contact sports and things like that. So if a person has, for example, just one kidney, maybe they had injury to one or one failed to develop, they typically don't recommend they play contact sports with just one kidney because if they lose that kidney, they're in bad shape because the kidneys are amazing in their ability to pick up the pace if the other kidney is missing or damaged or diseased. So we can live without one kidney and that's why you might have heard or seen people that have donated a kidney to a loved one because you know they had no kidney and being dependent on dialysis is very time consuming, time consuming and not ideal for homeostasis. So um, it's, it's quite a gift, but we can live with just one kidney. So there's a pair of ureters that drain urine from the kidney and take it to the bladder where it's stored because we're constantly making urine. So we need a storage container, otherwise the urine would be trickling out constantly out of our bodies. So the bladder just serves as a storage place for to hold that urine. And then this is a female shown here and you can see that the uterus um, is real close to the bladder. So as a developing uterus with the large fetuses on inside there, that sits right on top of the bladder. And that's why women at the end of pregnancy, um, one of the most difficult parts in the very end of pregnancy is getting up several times a night to go to the bathroom because of that location of the bladder and the uterus. So if you're ever in line at a crowded place, like a basketball game, football game, and you see a person who's quite pregnant come into the bathroom, let her skip in line and go next because there's, you know, sometimes it's an emergency situation when that happens. I mean, the pregnant lady needs to drink plenty of fluids too, and if she's sitting down watching a game and drinking some fluids and all of a sudden she has to go and there's a long line, that can really be stressful. So um, it's some, something to consider. And then also an interesting thing about pregnancy is the hormones of pregnancy early on also cause increased urination. Different reasons, but um, they also have, if so if a person is newly pregnant, they might notice that symptom. So functions of the kidney is removing toxins. So there's certain medicines that are broken down within the kidney. For example, we know that ibuprofen is, an, is a medicine that is broken down by the kidneys. So if someone has kidney disease, doctors aren't going to prescribe medicines that are in the category of where ibuprofen would be. We call those the NSAIDs, the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs like ibuprofen, Advil, Aleve, those medicines are all what we call NSAIDs and we don't give those to people with kidney disease. Or if we do, we are very careful depending on the level of kidney disease they have. Where Tylenol we know is metabolized in the liver. So they tell, you know, if someone's in for liver disease or they have, you know, hepatitis or cirrhosis of the liver, we're not going to give those patients Tylenol because that's going to further damage their liver. So the job is removing toxins, metabolic waste. One of those metabolic wastes is urea, which is from the breakdown of nitrogen containing products that we eat, such as, you said this in lab on Monday, protein. Yeah, when we eat meat, cheese, you know, yogurt, all those protein containing foods, um, some of that is broken down into urea. And excess ions from the blood. What do you think the number one ion that we're gonna find in urine here in the United States? We don't have any trouble getting this in our diet. Salt, yeah, sodium and chloride. Um, excesses of that are spilled out into the urine to regulate our, our blood. So regulation of blood volume, chemical composition, and pH kind of goes with that then. So if we have excess sodium, the excess sodium is filtered out by the kidneys and sent to the urine. If we have excess blood volume, let's say you had a lot of salt the day before, so you have a little extra blood volume, your body, your kidneys will kick in and pull out that excess fluid and you'll have increased urination the next day. So it's constantly sampling the blood volume. And if you're dehydrated, not bringing in enough fluid, 
you're not going to make as, as much urine because the kidneys are conserving fluid and keeping your blood volume up. So the kidneys are really a critical player in blood pressure regulation. So if you're dehydrated, the kidneys are going to produce less urine. If you're drinking a lot of fluid, like that big water bottle over there, you're going to produce more urine. So the kidneys are just critical to blood pressure control and volume and that chemical composition. So when you talk about chemical composition, we're talking about you know all the different ions that make up you know um, the compounds that we take in in our diet, and also looking at um, pH, acid base. What is the ion primarily in charge of pH? Hydrogen ion, right? So we have to maintain a blood pH of 7.35 to 7.45. That homeostatic mechanism to keep us in that range is accomplished primarily by the kidneys. So they're going to dump excess, filter out excess hydrogen ion, secrete it. There's different terms for this. We'll get into it as we go. Um, or reserve or reabsorb bicarbonate ion, because bicarbonate is a base. So, or it soaks up excess acid. We say it's basic because of that, because it soaks up that excess. Like sodium bicarbonate is baking soda, and that's a really good thing that if you don't have any Tums around and you have a bad case of acid indigestion, a little bit of dissolved baking soda and some water tastes terrible, but if you can get it down the hatch, it's going to resolve that acid indigestion and make you feel better and take care of heartburn. So anyway, um, so pH control is accomplished by absorbing and, or I'm sorry, filtering or secreting or reabsorbing hydrogen ion and bicarbonate ion. The two main processes, though, that are controlled and regulated are the secretion, where we're putting it into the kidney and becoming it in, or into the nephron and creating it in the urine or adding it to the urine, and reabsorption is where we take it from the nephron in the kidney and put it back in the blood. So we'll talk a lot about those processes. Other functions, kidneys are capable of uh, making glucose from non-sugar sources. Remember gluconeogenesis we talked about back with the metabolism and digestion um, units. And there's two hormones that the kidneys secrete. One is renin, and that helps fix a falling blood pressure. We talked a little bit about that, I think, in the cardiovascular system unit, didn't we? Didn't I mention that briefly? And then erythropoietin, that's quite a long word. We usually call it EPO, capital E, capital P, capital O. And when oxygen levels go down, the kidneys respond by stimulating, or by the kidneys are stimulated to release erythropoietin into the blood, which acts on the bone marrow, which tells the bone marrow to start increasing the red blood cell production. And if we increase, increase red blood cell production, we're going to get better oxygenation and you know, oxygen carrying capacity with more red blood cells. Maybe you've heard of blood doping before, where athletes will remove some of their blood. They'll have a doctor actually remove some of their blood. And then as a result of that, that stimulates the kidneys to secrete EPO. And then right before the event, the doctor will come back and reinsert that blood. And then now they've got extra red blood cells. It's their own red blood cells and they'll pass the tests for, you know, hematocrit, but, or not, they wouldn't, actually, they wouldn't pass the test for hematocrit, but they'll pass the test for, like, you know, false, you know, artificial chemicals trying to enhance performance. But now we know how to test for blood doping, and Lance Armstrong won the Tour de France one year, and he had that medal pulled, that award pulled, because he was caught blood doping. And when he was accused of it, he denied it. But then when they were able to do the testing to prove that he did it, he says, he, you know, so he couldn't deny it. Then he says, yes, you're right, I did it. And so did he, and so did he, and so did he. So he turned in a bunch of people that were doing it as well. So now we're getting a little smarter. And then activating vitamin D. So in the presence of sunlight, sun hits our skin, we create the precursor to vitamin D. Then it passes through the liver. The liver changes that molecule slightly to become more like the final form of vitamin D. And then that molecule passes through the kidneys, and then it's activated to its final form. And what do we need vitamin D for? There's a whole host of reasons, but what are the common ones that you may have heard of? To help us absorb calcium. Yeah, it's the partner to absorbing calcium. But we also know that it helps with immune function. We know that it helps fight depression. So there's a lot of other possible functions that we're not fully aware of. 
So the nephron is the structural and functional unit of the kidney. And what we say when we say structural and functional unit, it just means when we say the kidney's job is to make urine, what is the structure that makes urine? It's the nephron. So the nephron makes urine. We have a million of these in each of our kidneys. So we have about two million of these tiny little tubules that are constantly making urine. And some of them are found mostly in the cortex. We call those cortical nephrons. And some have long loops of Henle that dip down into the medulla of the kidney. So I passed out a handout. I want to pull that up here so I can reference it. Okay, so if we look at a typical kidney, the outer lighter portion is called the cortex, has kind of a granular appearance, and then the inner darker kind of has these lined appearances or striate appearance. This is the medulla. So if you look at the nephrons, most of the nephrons are out in the cortex. This one here, this real long one that extends down into the loop of hen or into the medulla, this is a um, what we call a juxtamedullary nephron. So it has a longer loop of Henle. So if we look down, we talked about the blood vessels in lab, right? Remember the arcuate artery and vein here at the top? So that's what we're looking at here. Here's kind of the junction between the medulla and the cortex right here, the arcuate artery and vein. So this is a cortical nephron. Most of it is in the cortex of the kidney and it has a pretty short loop of Henle. This here is a juxtamedullary nephron because it has a long loop of Henle. So if you want to, I mean, there's a lot of words and terms on here. If you want to just kind of highlight the names here, juxtamedullary and cortical, that'll allow it to stand out a little better for you. <clears throat> so we have, like I said, two million of these nephrons, and they're all clustered together in, you know, next to one another. And what holds them in place is simply connective tissue. So they're just embedded in connective tissue, kind of, you know, running the whole perimeter of the cortex. And their function is to form urine. And the juxtamedullary nephrons, though, are more important in developing a concentrated urine. And we'll talk about that um, when we get to that portion of the lecture. But know that 85% of our nephrons are the cortical kind, these kind here, with the short loops of Henle. And about 15% are the long loops of Henle, the juxtamedullary nephrons. Now, if you look at animals that produce very little urine and they live in really dry areas like the desert rat, most of their nephrons are the juxtamedullary because they need to produce a very concentrated small amount of urine. But regardless, we have to produce about 500 mils of urine a day regardless if we're bringing in fluid or not. Because if you look at the function, like I said, of the kidney here, let's get back to that. It's removal of toxins, metabolic wastes. So if we don't filter some of this urine out, and it's got to be in a fluid environment, so if we don't filter some fluid out of the blood into the kidney, those toxin, toxins would build up, the ions would build up, and we, that would change pH and destroy enzymes and lead to death. So we are always going to produce at least 500 mils of urine a day, regardless of the fluid we're bringing in. So what does that tell you? What's going to happen then if I'm stranded out in the desert and not drinking fluid for three days? I'm going to lose one and a half liters of fluid, which is going to drop what? What's going to kill me from that drop? What did you say? Blood pressure. Blood pressure is going to drop. I need fluid to keep that blood pressure up. And remember, the contraction of the heart is what pushes the blood through the system. And if there's not enough fluid for that heart to push to get out of the capillaries and feed the tissue cells, the tissue cells are going to die. So we can live about three days without water, and then that would lead to death. So that's kind of sometimes in a healthcare environment in the dying process when people stop eating and drinking, when they say, yeah, she's not eating or drinking, and they're giving her palliative care, which means there's no IV fluids coming in, you can expect that that person will probably pass within three days. Oftentimes sooner, because they already have other systems probably shutting down, kidneys are not functioning. But once they stop drinking, it happens pretty quickly. And as long as we keep them comfortable, because dehydration is uncomfortable. 
you know, it's, it's an uncomfortable feel. I mean, just being thirsty, you know what that feels like. But days of, of no fluid, you know, causes extreme headache and it's a painful death. So it's not something that if someone is awake and aware and you stop giving them fluids, that is, that is not a palliative death. That is one that would be uncomfortable. So as long as they're well medicated to be kept comfortable, then it's okay. All right, so moving on then, looking at um, the nephrons. So their job is to make urine. Like I said, 85% are the corticals. Make sure you highlight that number. So the job is to make urine, and most of that urine is water. So where does the water come from? Where does, how does water get into our body? By drinking. So to keep our kidneys functioning well, we really need to hydrate well. So oftentimes we say as a society that we are underhydrated. That if you ever get thirsty during the day, you're already down the path of dehydration. You should never feel thirsty if you're properly hydrating yourself. So that's something that we need to, to improve. And a way to do that is to bring a water bottle with you wherever you go. Some people make the mistake of drinking soda because they think they're thirsty. And teenagers, um, in my own house, I can say this happens. They think they're thirsty, so they drink that Mountain Dew. Did we talk about this previously this semester? Or they drink the sugary Mountain Dew, which causes, that's a lot of solute, which pulls water from the tissues. And then as a result of that, they feel thirsty again. So it starts this vicious cycle. So if you want to cut down on your soda intake, intake drink water, because you're not going to crave the soda if you're well hydrated. Yes? All I can say is that caffeine acts on the kidney and causes um, um, blocks water reabsorption and co uh, contributes to more urine. Not being, we haven't gotten to this in the, in the lecture, so I'm trying to come up with words that make sense. So less water is, is reabsorbed and sent back to the blood and it stays in the nephron and goes to the bladder. Alcohol does the same thing. It has to do with the hormones that regulate water reabsorption in the nephron, and we're going to talk about that. So, yeah, you want to avoid caffeine, you know, if you're not going to drink any water during the day, right? But caffeine is good for people that are on a fluid restriction, you know, and they've got heart failure, then that's something that they, we still limit coffee as well, but they can drink a little bit of coffee, and it's not going to have as big an impact if they had like a sugary soda or even a diet soda. Diet soda is really bad for people with heart failure because it has a fluid and it has a salt in it, which they need to limit also. So most of it's water, 5% is solutes, nitrogenous waste. We already talked about, um, well, we talked about urea, ure uric acid, and creatinine. Where does, where does creatinine come from? What? Creatine phosphate, muscle breakdown, right? We talked about as a source of energy in muscle cells. So we also get that from our diet, right? Some people um, drink this in the form of a powder, right? Maybe you have bodybuilders and things if you're using, you know, short bursts of high power muscle activity. And then a lot of those solutes we already talked about. But if we see a lot of these in the urine, like increased potassium in the urine. That can happen when people are on diuretics, so people that need to lower their blood pressure. Maybe they're on this medicine we call Lasix or furosemide. That causes them to increase urination to keep their blood volume down, which lowers their blood pressure. But at the same time, it interferes with the reabsorption of potassium. So as a result of that, they lose potassium in the urine, and that can cause imbalances. Because what do we need potassium for? It was on your exam. Yeah, repolarization, right? It's muscle cells, right? And the action potential. So it's going to ca cause nerve and muscle dysfunction. For the, one, the number one muscle we're most concerned about, though, that brings people to the hospital with potassium imbalances is the heart. Yeah, yeah. So some of these ions are secreted, reabsorbed, and if there's deficiencies, issues within the kidney that's going to interfere with their secretion or absorption, we're going to see that in the urine, and then we can replace or limit depending on what the problem is. So what brings the urine from the kidney, when the nephrons make the urine, it, it collects in the pelvis and then it drains to the ureters. And the ureters are lined with smooth muscle, and when, when they stretch with a little bit of urine entering them, 
that causes the smooth muscle to constrict, or to contract, not constrict, contract. And as that smooth muscle contracts, that brings the urine down into the bladder. So the stretch stimulates that peristalsis, that smooth muscle wave-like contractions. And then as the bladder gets fuller and fuller and fuller, that will contract the ends of the ureters to prevent urine from going back up into the kidneys. But that can happen. We can get urine backing up into the kidneys because if urine is not draining down the ureters and the bladder is full and constricted, urine is going to back up on the other side, right? If the, maybe the ends of the ureters are constricted, but what about the urine that's newly coming down the pipe, right? That's going to back up if the bladder isn't emptied. So we really have to watch our input and our output of our patients. The urinary system is a critical system for keeping the whole body in homeostasis. I mean, every system is, right, to a point, but as far as how things can go bad quickly is if you have a fluid imbalance in your patient. For example, they were down in the ER and they were put on a high amount of IV fluids and the doctor forgot about it and you're the nurse working with that patient and you three, four days later after eating and drinking and feeling well, they're still on, you know, 150 mils an hour of a fluid, of a maintenance fluid. That can cause fluid overload and cause high blood pressure, damage the kidneys. We really have to be careful with that. And if somebody has kidney disease, do we want to put them on high doses of IV fluids? No, we got to really be careful with replacing electrolytes and fluids in people with kidney disease because they're not going to produce the urine to balance that out. So we have to be extra careful. And it's simply just clicking in the chart. It's just knowing what to look for. And it's not difficult stuff to look for. All I look for when I click in the chart is a, is a bar graph, the intake and the output. So how much they're drinking or getting via IV fluids versus how much they're peeing. And that should be well charted. And sometimes we forget, right? As busy nurses' aides, you know, you empty a potty hat and you go to the next place and the next place and the next place and you never put that in the chart. Well, if the nurse happens to look in there before you charted that big, huge urination, maybe it was 500 mils, you know, they're going to say, oh, gosh, she didn't go all day. Oh, we got a problem now that she's off calling the doctor, you know, figuring out, you know, maybe increasing the dosage of the Lasix, the, the diuretic where actually that little slip of paper is in your pocket and she wouldn't need any do increase in dosing. So it's really, really important when you're working, if you work in healthcare, whether you're a nurse or nurse's aide, put that input, that output in and the input in the computer, okay? So if there's an empty water pitcher, get that number in the computer right away. Don't wait for later because decisions are sometimes being made while you're carrying those numbers around. It's really, really critical. So like I said, I just look for that bar graph. And if I see a big difference like that, it might be good if we're trying to pull fluid off of a heart failure patient. We want to see a big output compared to input. So that's fine. But if I see it the other way, you know, very little output and a lot of input, and then my patient tells me, gosh, I just feel really swollen and tight. That happened to me just recently, and I was, I think I told you that. Did I tell this class that? Maybe it was a different one. Um, I was checking your armband to give her a medicine. I'm like, oh, your armband is really tight. That can't be comfortable. She says, yeah, it wasn't like that before. Right away, red flag, let's look on the chart. Sure enough, bar graph was way out of balance. Looked at her fluids. She still had the high fluids running, and I said, have you been eating and drinking okay? Yeah, no problem. Call the doctor, DC the fluids, no big deal. And then she peed a bunch overnight. I worked an overnight that night. Asked her in the morning, she says, oh, I feel so much better. Of course, because we just stopped that constant drip of fluid into her system. And her kidneys were healthy, and she was able to handle it. So it's something that we can easily fix, but you have to have that knowledge to look for it. And that's where people say, oh, I don't need advanced a &P. I'm just going to go get a, take it somewhere where it's a no-brainer class because I just want to be a nurse. Well, that's scary because if you don't know fluid balance at the bedside, that's where mistakes happen. I mean, how often have you heard of mistakes with you, your family members, where somebody wasn't watching something and something went bad? You know, that's nursing knowledge and doctor knowledge too, of course. But, you know, we're there with the patients more than the doctors are. So we, we don't have to have the advanced knowledge, but we got to have this basic knowledge of just looking in the chart, knowing that fluids in should be fluids out. All right, moving on. So, the, so looking at the nephron in more detail, the glomerulus is kind of the beginning where it all starts. So this is where the vascular system meets the renal system, is at the glomerulus. So the renal artery comes off of the abdominal aorta. So if we go back up to my first slide here, here's the abdominal aorta bringing fresh blood down from the, where does the aorta come from? Yeah, what part? 
the left ventricle. So the left ventricle contracts, sends a pressure wave down the abdominal aorta into the renal artery. And that renal artery ends with the glomerulus. So we're going to go back to the worksheet that I gave you. So it branches and branches and branches within the kidney. So this is what we talked about in lab. So here's the renal artery. It branches into the segmental artery, then into the interlobar artery, then the arcuate artery, right? So it branches until we get to this final cortical radiate artery, right? It just continues to branch, and that <coughs> leads to a glomerulus. So this little cluster of capillaries is the glomerulus. So this vessel leading to the glomerulus is called the afferent arterial. So this is the one that is going to be most directly influenced by blood pressure, wouldn't you agree? Because whatever that left ventricle, what kind of force that left ventricle exerts, that pressure wave is, goes through all the arteries, including the renal artery and all the branches of the renal artery, till we get to the afferent arterial. Now, what do you think about this glomerulus in terms of its strength? There's two million of these in the kidneys. I think these are strong, tough vessels, this little cluster of glomeruli. No, they're very thin, fragile, because we want to have easy passage of plasma through this. So they're leaky. What would they have what we call fenestrations, and that allows fluid to flow freely out of the glomerulus under very little pressure. So how do we decrease the pressure in this afferent arterial? Bless you. How do we decrease pressure? How do you decrease the you know, the flow of anything coming out of a tube. If you wanted to slow down, but you, we, we're not going to stop the heart. I mean, we could. We could slow the heart, right? We could give someone a beta blocker, you know, to slow the heart. But let's say we're not going to influence that. How does the kidney, how does the body control the flow into that afferent arterial so we don't have a high pressure damaging those glomeruli? Dilate, is dilating, if I make a vessel bigger, does that increase or decrease the flow? What? It increases it. So if I want to slow the flow to protect my fragile glomerulus, I'm going to constrict that afferent arterial. Yes, so the afferent arterial has a thicker, more muscular wall in order to adapt to whatever it needs to do in terms of blood pressure to control the flow into that glomerulus. So the next picture has a nice blown up picture. So here's the afferent arterial. So blood flows in under the pressure. You know, there's, there's normal pressure outside of it. Like in the renal artery, for example, the pressure might be 95 millimeters of mercury. But by the time it gets into this afferent arterial and the glomerulus, that pressure has dropped down to 55. So it's still high. It's higher than most, than all the other capillaries in the body, that hydrostatic pressure. The capillary hydrostatic is the highest of all the capillaries in the body. But it's, it's reduced from the general mean arterial blood pressure of the, of the system by constricting that afferent arterial. Yes? What? No, because you're thinking about what's you're, um, you're thinking about the pressure beyond the constriction. So if we if we slow the flow into that glomerulus, that's going to decrease the pressure in the glomerulus. Yeah, I think you're thinking of in the vessel itself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're we're worried about the pressure beyond the constriction. Yeah, good question. So if we squeeze, make this afferent arterial smaller, that will slow flow. Okay, so there's a lot of control of that diameter of that afferent arterial. But a couple more things I want to mention here is that if we look at the glomerulus um, and compare it to other capillaries in the body, usually when you have fluid entering into a capillary bed at the arterial end, fluid flows out, right? Of the, in, the net flow is out of the capillary bed, and then we get to the venule end, we see mostly reabsorption. Because do we want to have all of our plasma spill out into our tissues? No, that's why we talked about the different pressures that act on the arterial end versus the venule end. So we see fluid leave the arterial end of the capillary bed, and then it's reabsorbed on the venule end. So how many 
liters of fluid do we actually lose that enter the lymphatics that are not reabsorbed at the venule end? This was on the test. Three liters, yeah. So that's kind of like the body's sewer system. Any excess fluid that's not reabsorbed in the tissues enters the lymphatics. And then it goes back to the blood closer to the heart, right? So the only difference between the glomerulus and those capillary beds is that do we want any fluid returning to the glomerulus? Not really, because this, this network continues on around the nephron. So the glomerulus, we only see movement out of the glomerulus. We don't see reabsorption into the glomerulus. The net pressure acting outward is always positive. We always have fluid leaving. Where, again, if it was a different capillary bed, we'd have a lot of fluid leaving, and at the end of the capillary bed, where it becomes, starts to you know, lead to the venules, we have a lot, most of that fluid going back in but that's not the case in the glomerulus. It's all acting outward. So if you wanted to draw you know, arrows across the glomerulus, all going outward, that's the net movement of fluid is out of the glomerulus. We have different pressures that influence that outward pressure, but the net pressure, and that's what's right here, highlight this. This is a term, you'll, or a, a term and a number you'll need to know. The net filtration pressure at the glomerulus is 10 millimeters of mercury. And we'll talk more about that number a little later. But one thing I want you to pay attention to, though, is do those vessels change in color at all? Is there any delivery of oxygen or nutrients in the glomerulus? No, it's all red, so it all stays oxygenated. We're not, we're not feeding oxygen to the kidneys yet. Let's go back to our PowerPoint. So the paratubular capillaries is where the, ch the change in oxygen levels occur. So this is where we lose some oxygen to the kidney cells to keep them alive. And now this is where we see the capillaries leading to venules like we see in a typical capillary bed. So you have arterioles on one side, venules on the other, and then a change in oxygen across that, that passage from arterial to venule. So if you go back to your handout and look at this diagram again, you can see that here's my efferent arterial. So we have blood coming in through the afferent. Some of that plasma is squeezed out, and whatever remains in the glomerulus continues on out the efferent arterial and then turns into paratubular capillaries. And if we follow that paratubular capillary, you can see that it leaves the nephron and becomes part of the, vent, the venous system. And then it's going to go back and join the general circulation. So the paratubular capillaries are an extension of the efferent arterial, which eventually leads to the venous system. So you can see they're kind of a light purplish color. And that's because the transition is occurring there from highly oxygenated to low oxygen in the veins. So going back here then. So highlight efferent arterioles, and they empty into the venules. Another special capillary bed is the vasa recta that we see associated with long loops of Henle and those juxtamedullary nephrons. And those are important for creating a dilute urine. And we'll talk more about that concept in the next lecture. But here's the vasa recta. So again, here's our efferent arterial up here. And as it comes down, it wraps around the loop of Henle and helps create a concentration gradient as we go deeper into the medulla. And we'll, like I said, we'll talk more about that later. But the same thing, it goes back into the venules and becomes part of the venous system again. So terms, a lot of this is just terminology, kind of getting those straight. Vasa recta, part of the vascular system. Paratubular capillaries, vascular. Glomerulus, vascular. So we're all still kind of talking about the cardiovascular system. We we're talking about those specific structures. But you can see in the diagram of those structures that, that they have a very intimate relationship. They're very close to the nephron, right? So the nephron is going to receive things that get squeezed out of the blood. But at the same time, as we continue on through the nephron, we're going to see that the nephron then delivers things back to the blood. That's called reabsorption. 
so we can whatever gets filtered out in the glomerulus is very much um, uncontrolled. It's just a squeezing out based on pressure only. So we don't want to lose all that urine and uh, or all that water, I should say. We don't want to use all that fluid. We don't want to lose all those electrolytes. We need to reabsorb those back to the blood very quickly, and a lot of that happens in the first part of the nephron that we're going to talk about. So we talked about the blood pressure coming into the glomerulus is you know about 90, 95 millimeters of mercury, and it drops to around 8 millimeters of mercury in the kidneys to you know, cross that afferent arterial. So that resistance by constricting the afferent arterial is really boss when it comes to protecting the glomerulus. And then the efferent arterial, when it constricts, it's going to maintain that pressure inside the glomerulus. And it's also going to prevent too much hydrostatic pressure in the paratubular capillaries beyond the efferent arterial. So if you think of what they control, it kind of makes sense. So this is um, the juxtaglomerular apparatus. Uh, one more thing I want to mention, uh, let's see, afferent arterioles. Before we talk about the juxtaglomerular apparatus, Um, the, the size of the arterioles is auto-regulated, which means that when pressures change, that causes the afferent arterial to reflexively constrict. So increase in blood pressure, like I said, is going to cause constriction of the afferent arterial, and that's going to decrease the blood pressure in the glomerulus, right, so you don't damage the, the kidneys. And the same thing, what would happen if we have a falling blood pressure? blood pressure is on the lower side. What is going to happen to that afferent arterial to maintain filtration? It's going to dilate. So just know the relationship between the size of the afferent arterial and the systemic blood pressure. Okay, so this special contraption here is called the juxtaglomerular apparatus. And if you think about what an apparatus means, it's made up of a lot of different parts. So there's three different cells that are working together to form this juxtaglomerular apparatus. So the first one, the first cells, set of cells we're going to talk about are granular cells. So there's a nice diagram that I've included here. It looks like this. If you want to turn to your worksheet, you know, look at this diagram here that looks like this. So the afferent arterial oops, has these granular cells, which are found here. And their job is to detect changes in volume that are re that's related to pressure, right? So if I have increased pressure coming into the glomerulus, that's going to stretch those granular cells. So they're smooth muscle cells that when they stretch, I'm sorry, when they have a decreased stretch, so this is, works for a falling blood pressure. When there's decreased blood pressure, falling pressure, the decreased stretch stimulates these granular cells to secrete renin. And we talked about renin is that hormone that's going to raise blood pressure. So they have mechanoreceptors, which are receptors that detect movement of the membrane. So if there's less stretch, that stimulates those receptors, and the, the granular cells secrete renin. So on the bottom of the worksheet I gave you on this um, apparatus, you'll see I wrote granular cells, macula densa cells, and mesangial cells. Just make sure you write where they're found. So granular cells are found where? What part of that? JGA structure, juxtular, juxtaglomerular apparatus. What part? There's a lot of different things in this picture here. So where do we just say? Look at your PowerPoint. Which arterial? Yeah, the afferent arterial. So they're found in the walls. They're smooth muscle cells in the walls of the afferent arterial. That's what the granular cells are. And they secrete renin, renin, renin. So that's one part of it. 
another player in this game. Our cells in the ascending limb of the loop of Henle. So the loop of Henle is part of the nephron. It comes up and passes by the glomerulus before it becomes the distal convoluted tubule. So this structure right here is the ascending loop of Henle. And see these cells here that line that? These are called the macula densa cells. So you can label that in your diagram in your worksheet. Ma macula densa cells. And what these guys do is when there's an increase in blood pressure coming from the systemic circulation, there's going to be an increase in sodium flying by these cells. So these, are, these have chemoreceptors, so you want to highlight the word chemoreceptors. So the macula densa cells are chemoreceptors. They sense sodium chloride. So if we have increased blood pressure, that's going to cause a speedy flow of sodium past these macula densa cells. And those macula densa cells secrete three different things. One thing they're going to secrete is ATP and adenosine if there's increased sodium flow due to increased blood pressure. And that acts, ATP and adenosine acts on the afferent arterial and causes it to constrict. So the macula densa cells help constrict that afferent arterial even more. It's kind of just a supportive thing. So the afferent arterial already is doing some constriction, and then the macula densa cells of the loop of Henle are helping it as well. So again, the macula densa cells are here. They're secreting adenosine and ATP to act on the afferent arterial to cause it to constrict. And what is that going to do to the blood pressure on the glomerulus? going to reduce it or decrease it, right? Because if we have an increased flow of sodium past here, that's due to an increased blood pressure. And we don't want to damage that glomerulus with a high blood pressure in the systemic circulation. So that's what protects that. And then we have these mesangial cells, which are right in between here. And what these do is they have gap junctions. So if these are stimulated, so if the the macula densa cells are stimulated by high blood pressure, or the um, granular cells are stimulated by a low blood pressure. The action potentials that are generated by those mechanoreceptors in the case of the granular cells, or the chemoreceptors in the case of the macula densa, those action potentials are going to flow between those two areas through the mesangial cells. So mesangial cells you want to write a, just a basic function is they have gap junctions to communicate between the macula densa and the granular cells. So they don't really have a specific job other than just to have gap junctions and allow that action potential to flow between the two parts, the two major players of the juxtaglomerular apparatus. So looking at, um, I wanted to mention one more thing of the um, macula densa cells, that if we have a decreased blood pressure, that the macula densa cells will have a decreased secretion of ATP, less adenosine secretion. They're going to re reduce that. But they're going to increase nitric oxide. So a third thing that the macula densa cells secrete is nitric oxide. And nitric oxide, nitric oxide is a dilator of vessels. And that's why when people are having chest pain, they do sublingual nitro, right? Because that's a precursor, the same, acts the same as nitric oxide and dilates blood vessels. So the macula densa cell is going to secrete ATP and adenosine if we have a high blood pressure coming in, which will cause high sodium flow. And that's going to act to constrict the afferent arterial. And then if we have a low blood pressure, it's going to dilate the afferent arterial by secreting what? Just to make sure everybody's paying attention. I know you're getting droopy at, after 6 o'clock and you had an exam today. What? Nitric oxide. Yes, nitric oxide. Okay. So 
that's what we call the juxtaglomerular apparatus. What is its main job then? If you think about it, selfishly, the granular cells are concerned with controlling blood pressure. I'm sorry. Yeah, controlling blood pressure. Yeah, because when it secretes that renin, renin enters the bloodstream and travels throughout the bloodstream and up in the lungs is in is it, well, it actually acts as an enzyme for angiotensin 1, and the lungs contain an enzyme for converting angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2, which acts as a vasoconstrictor. So when we have low blood pressure, we want to increase the pressure going to the um, tissues. So renin is a powerful, I'm sorry, um, I got I got myself talked into a corner here. <clears throat> so renin helps convert angiotensin or starts the pathway of angiotensin 1 being converted to angiotensin 2 by the enzyme angiotensin converting enzyme up in the lungs and angiotensin 2 is the is the final product we're looking for which causes vasoconstriction and that's going to raise a falling blood pressure. So that's the job of the granular cells, is to fix a falling blood pressure. Yes? These are the prills, like lisinopril. That's a, lisinopril is an ACE inhibitor, and that's a very common side effect of that specific medicine, the lisinopril. Yeah. Why it causes a cough, you know, I'm not sure. It's maybe something related to that, you know the blocking of that enzyme up in the lungs because that's where the lungs or that's where the enzymes located very good putting together I like it yeah we could look that up actually and see if that's related now you have me thinking yeah good question <clears throat> okay so the filtration membrane is the relationship kind of like we looked at the respiratory membrane right was the pulmonary capillary and the alveoli so now the filtration membrane is the glomerulus which is here, here's the walls of the glomerulus. Here's the plasma coming into the glomerulus via the afferent arteriole. And here is Bowman's capsule, right, that's on the other side. So the glomerulus empties into Bowman's capsule. So there's a basement membrane between them. And this helps control movement of substances from the plasma into Bowman's capsule. So what we can say, first of all, is look at the big spaces here in the glomerulus, in the walls of the glomerulus. Those holes or pores are called fenestrations. So fenestrations are just spaces between the cells that we see in certain capillaries that are extra leaky. And we want the, we want the kidneys to be extra leaky because the goal is to get that fluid out under relatively low pressure in that delicate glomerulus. Then we have on the side of the uh, Bowman's capsule, we have cells with these podocytes that actually kind of prevent substances from coming through into Bowman's capsule. And then we have a basement membrane that is a barrier to large proteins, because large proteins could slip right through these fenestrations. And what protein do we really need to keep in our plasma to keep our blood pressure up? Albumin, yeah. So we want to keep the large albumin proteins in there. But smaller proteins, maybe the proteins that need to be, you know, filtered away and urinated out, we do have a small amount of protein in our urine, and that's okay. So some smaller proteins can leak out. So those will be able to pass through this basement membrane, but this basement membrane is impermeable to large proteins. So then we have these little foot processes called podocytes that help, again, just maintain the integrity of this barrier here so large proteins don't sneak through. But anything less than three nanometers, so we're looking at glucose, amino acids, all of our electrolytes, all of our ions, water, all of that can pass freely through the membrane. But do we want to pee away all of our glucose, amino acids, and water? No. So that's why the, why the blood vessels are wrapped around that nephron to reabsorb some of those things back. But up in the glomerulus, it's pretty free filtering. There's not a lot of selection other than the big plasma proteins. Those cannot leave the glomerulus. And what else is in that glomerulus that can't leak out? The solid part of our blood, which is? 
Yeah, red blood cells and white blood cells. So no plasma proteins, no albumin, no red blood cells, no white blood cells. Those are going to stay in the glomerulus. They're not going to leak out through that membrane. <coughs> So of all the fluid that's filtered out of the glomerulus, 99% of it is going to be reabsorbed back into the blood through the paratubular capillaries and the vasa recta. So that's the good news. Only 1% of what's filtered at the glomerulus actually becomes urine. 99% goes right back to the blood. But it's a sub more selective process because filtration is non-selective. It's just push, pressure, hydrostatic pressure pushes everything out. So filtration is just going from the glomerulus to Bowman's capsule. It's non-selective, so you should add that. Non-selective. So we're just dumping all that stuff out, and then in a, in, it depends on the net filtration pressure of the glomerulus, which is about 10 millimeters of mercury. And then tubular reabsorption is taking all that stuff back to the blood. So the term reabsorption means we're absorbing it again. When did we reabsorb this stuff the first time? Why don't we just call it absorption? Well, we already absorbed it one other time. A different system absorbed it. When? Yeah, the digestive system absorbed it the first time when we drank and ate our electrolytes and fluids. So we reabsorbed it to the blood there, out of the digestive cavity, right? Or the digestive tract. Now we're reabsorbing it again out of the nephron. So. When it's going back to the blood, we're all, and anytime we use the word absorption, you're thinking going to the blood, because that's where it's going to help the body and be delivered to the rest of the system is from the blood. And then secretion is taking it from the blood and putting it back into the urine, putting it back in the nephron. And that's a very selective process. So if we want to get rid of excess hydrogen ion, we are going to secrete it from the blood into the nephron. So here's kind of a summary. This is just taking the nephron and making it one straight pipe. But of course, it doesn't look like that, right? It has the loop of Henle and the proximal and distal convoluted tubule. But this just really summarizes it all. And again, the vascular system is much more you know, intricate than what's shown here. But it's a nice just summary, looking at the direction that things are moving. So tubular reabsorption, it's leaving the nephron going back to the blood. Filtration, leaving the blood, entering the nephron. Again, no energy required. It's a, just a pressure process called filtration. Filtration is the movement of substances by pressure differences. And then secretion is going from the blood back to the urine. So again, glomerular filtration, the key thing to, to highlight here is that it's a passive process. And it's due to hydrostatic pressure. So the pressure of fluid inside that glomerulus is going to drive filtration. The more pressure on the glomerulus, the more filtration we're going to have. And it's a good filter. It's very permeable because of the big spaces, the fenestrations that it has. And because it's a cluster of capillaries, it has a large surface area. And anything greater than 5 nanometers is not going to be filtered. So plasma proteins, for example, like we said, and now the best example of a plasma protein were the, what's albumin, right? So here's the, that change in pressures. Though we talked about in the cardiovascular system, the hydrostatic pressures push out of that space and the osmotic pressures suck into that space. Remember, hydrostatic pressure is due to pressure of the fluid up against the wall, and osmotic pressure is caused by what? What? Plur proteins and other solutes that draw water in by osmosis. So we say osmotic pressures suck in, hydrostatic pressures push out. So if you look at the arrows here, that makes sense. Blood colloid osmotic pressure. So blood, in the blood, there's plasma proteins that are going to suck fluid into the glomerulus because the plasma proteins here create an osmotic pressure. And we say that's about 30. Look at the capsular um, osmotic pressure. It's not even listed. Why would that be? Should there be any plasma proteins out here? No, no. So that's why it's given a value of zero. But there's some fluid in here, so that does exert a hydrostatic pressure. And remember, the hydrostatic pressure is push out of the space, so that's going to push out of Bowman's capsule into the blood. 
So if I balance these, what is acting out versus what is acting in, what do you have? I have the glomerular hydrostatic pressure is acting out, correct? 55 is acting out. And then blood colloid and capsular hydrostatic both act into the glomerulus. So what's the difference? 10. 55 minus 45, 10 is acting out, and that's the pressure that's going to be exerted outward and causing filtration. And again, this number can change depending on the systemic blood pressure, right? So the systemic blood pressure really influences the pressure inside here. Which of these pressures is affected by my systemic blood pressure? Which of these three pr pressures? Yep, the glomerular or blood hydrostatic pressure. So circle that one, make a note there so you remember that. That's a key concept to understand is if my blood pressure is up because I've my heart's pounding really hard or I've got vascular resistance all over the body from plaque buildup, high cholesterol, that's going to increase glomerular hydrostatic pressure. And that's going to be hard on the kidneys. And that's the damage that bl high blood pressure does is you have high pressure on those kidneys. So the rate at which plasma is squeezed out of the glomerulus is 120 to 125 milliliters per minute. So that's the glomerular filtration rate. And this is something we look at in labs of patients. Looking at kidney function, we talk about what is their GFR, glomerular filtration rate. So if the kidneys are working well, we should see a glomerular filtration rate between 120 and 125. So as long as my filtration membrane is functional and I've got a decent pressure going into the kidneys, I, I can maintain that filtration rate. So there's different controls for filtration, and we'll pick up with that in our next lecture.